Welcome to the Organic Chemistry video content to accompany Organic Chemistry 1 Lecture Guide and Organic Chemistry Primer. The problems in this video come from Part 1, Structure, Stability, and Conventions. Our first problem is to define chirality. Chirality is simply the term we use for handedness when it applies to molecules. If a molecule lacks symmetry, it is going to be a chiral compound. Knowing that, we can identify whether each of these molecules is chiral or achiral. In this first example, we see that there's no way to draw a plane of symmetry, and therefore it must be a chiral molecule. The second example also lacks a plane of symmetry. One of the mistakes people sometimes make is they try to draw a plane of symmetry here, but that would try to make some symmetry between a CH3 and a bromo. So again, that's not a plane of symmetry, and this is a chiral molecule. This third one, sometimes people will try to indicate symmetry here, but it's not really symmetric. It does matter whether there's a single or double bond here. So that breaks up the symmetry, and this is also a chiral molecule. Now, only if all of the bonds and all of the groups are identical on each side of this plane of symmetry, do we have a molecule that lacks handedness? It is an achiral molecule. Now the plane of symmetry may be a little bit more difficult to see in a case like this, where if you look visually, it looks like it's not symmetric. But a plane that cuts through the chlorine and the fluorine atoms would be a plane of symmetry for this molecule. An easier way to identify the lack of chirality is to say, this carbon can't be a chiral center unless there are four different groups attached to it. So as soon as you identify the fact that these two groups are identical coming off of that carbon, you know this is an achiral molecule. This last one has a different substituent on each side in addition to this CH3 and the H that's not drawn that represents four different groups on the carbon. That is a chiral molecule. A related task would be to identify planes of symmetry in molecules. If you identify a carbon and on each side you have the same group, there should be a plane of symmetry that passes through that carbon atom. So that's a plane of symmetry right there. There are no planes of symmetry available in this molecule, but there is a plane of symmetry in this molecule, as in this molecule bromine and this bromine are identical. This molecule has a plane of symmetry that passes through the carbon in the center and bisects the Cl and the F substituents. And then this molecule would have a plane of symmetry in the plane of the page. So there are a variety of different dispositions that planes of symmetry may take in molecules. And a very good way to identify these and convince yourself of these different scenarios is to build models of these with a model kit and have a physical object in your hand that you can manipulate and visualize these planes of symmetry. Now in addition to being able to identify planes of symmetry or chiral centers and differentiate chiral from achiral molecules, uh, there is a set of vocabulary that goes with understanding of stereochemistry. So in this problem we are first asked to define the terms enantiomer and diastereomer. So we can fill those definitions in from the primer. Enantiomers are non-superimposable mirror images. Non-superimposable simply meaning not the same. And diastereomers are not superimposable. They're not the same. But they are not mirror images of one another. And in addition to being able to spit out these definitions, we should also be able to draw the enantiomer or the diastereomer of a given structure. Since an enantiomer is the mirror image, each of the stereocenters should be inverted between two enantiomers. So if we try to draw the enantiomer of this structure, it would look like this, wherein both of the wedges have been switched to hashed lines. There are actually two ways to draw diastereomers for this molecule. And in a diastereomer, it can't be the same. So it can't just be two wedges. 
but it has to be different. So we can switch either of the two wedges to a hash line. So here are the two possibilities. Either of those two molecules would be a good answer for a diastereum or for the original structure that was drawn. Now how do we expect the stability and melting points to be related for these molecules? Well, two enantiomers have the same stability, the same boiling points as one another. But either of those two enantiomers will have a different stability, a different boiling point, a different melting point from the other diastereomers. So if the boiling point and the stability and various other properties are identical between two enantiomers, how do we even tell them apart? Well, one way is to use the specific rotation, that is the angle at which these types of molecules rotate plane polarized light. Even if we don't know which isomer we have, we can look at a sample in a polarimeter, investigate the direction that the plane polarized light is rotated, either counterclockwise, which would be termed a levorotatory isomer, or clockwise, which would be termed a dextrorotatory isomer. In this problem, it's asking us to label these as levorotatory or dextrorotatory based on the specific rotation, which would be measured by polarimetry. All we need to know is that a positive sign by convention represents a clockwise rotation of the light, and that is a dextrorotatory isomer. So even if you're given a completely fake name, like stereo fake molecule and all, if you know the specific rotation is positive, you know it's a dextrorotatory isomer. And if you're told that there is another molecule called amazing wonderful known, and it has a negative specific rotation, you know that that is levorotatory. A challenge to chemists is to be able to separate mixtures of enantiomers or other isomers. So a problem like this has some significant practical applications. So if you know that a pure sample of a dextrorotatory compound, 100% dextrorotatory, has a specific rotation of 8 degrees under a certain set of conditions, the question is, what specific rotation would I observe if instead of being pure, the sample contained 25% levorotatory and 75% of the dextrorotatory isomer. So we'll jot down the composition and that 25% levorotatory, well we know that the dextrorotatory rotates the light 8 degrees. Levorotatory would rotate negative 8 degrees. But we only have 25% of that, so 25% of that 8 degrees, the levorotatory part of that sample will rotate the light by negative 2 degrees we have 75% of the dextrorotatory. 100% of that dextrorotatory isomer rotates a full 8 degrees, but we only have 75% of that much. It's going to rotate a plus 6 degrees. That's 75% of 8. Overall, the minus 2 will cancel out some of the plus 6, and overall we will see a rotation of plus 4 degrees. And by doing this math, we can figure out the relative composition of a mixture of enantiomers like this. Another challenge is to label the configuration of a given molecule based only on its structure, even if we don't know whether it is a dextrorotatory or levorotatory isomer. For this purpose, scientists have developed the R and S labels. They are not related to dextrorotatory and levorotatory labels. Those have to do with rotating plane polarized light. R and S are determined on the basis solely of the structures of the molecules, using the kahn ingold prelog conventions for prioritizing the substituents. In order to provide an R or S label configuration, it might be easiest to start off by labeling each stereogenic center in this set of molecules. They're relatively easy to identify. For stereogenic carbons, you must have four different groups on the carbon. So we'll go through and label each of the carbon atoms that has four distinctly different groups coming off of it. So I've gone through and labeled these and a, a few points bear noting. One point is just because 
someone has drawn a wedge or a hashed line in a structure does not mean that the atom to which that's attached is a chiral center. You see that there are two methyl groups here. This one happens to be drawn on a wedge, but this carbon is not a stereogenic center. It's not going to be something we label as being chiral. Another point is that if you are in a cyclic structure, the way that you determine whether there are four different groups is relatively easy if they're not part of the cycle. Sure, a hydrogen is definitely different from a methyl group, but when you compare this substituent, it's a CH2 initially, it initially ties with this one, both are CH2. They become different when you move a little farther away. If you move a second carbon away, you say, oh, this is a carbon with a bromine. Second carbon away here on this side is a carbon with just hydrogens. So they are different. And similarly, when you look at the carbon on this far right structure, there's a hydrogen, there's an OH. On the right, there's a carbon with a double bond. On the left, there's a carbon with only single bonds. Those are different from one another. All right, so we figured out all of the stereogenic centers in these molecules. So let's start assigning the R or S labels. To do that, we need to prioritize the groups coming off of each carbon that is a chiral center. So to do that, we will use the Conningold prelog rules. This is substituent one, highest priority, second highest priority, third highest priority, fourth highest priority. Now, if your fourth highest priority substituent off of that chiral center is in the back, you will do a simple count of one to two to three. If that proceeds in a counterclockwise motion, as if you're turning a steering wheel in a left-hand turn, as this one is, that's an S isomer. If we do the same thing for this chiral center here, filling in the hydrogen, we say that's the fourth priority, third priority, first priority, second priority. And if you don't know how to prioritize, you'll want to go back and review the Conningold prelog rules. That's a precursor, a prerequisite, to being able to assign R and S isomers. Now in a case like this, where the fourth priority substituent comes towards you, well, that's backwards of what you want, or what we had in the first pro part of this problem. So we need to count backwards, three, two, one. And that's again an S isomer. So let's move on to the second molecule. We have this stereogenic center here. We have the fourth priority substituent in the back. Third, first going towards the right around the top. Second going this way. Fourth priority is in the back. We go one to two to three. That's the direction you would turn a steering wheel for a right hand turn. That's a clockwise progression from one to two to three. That is an R isomer. Now let's look at the other chiral carbon in this structure. Bromine is a much higher atomic number than the other things attached. That's going to be priority one. H is going to be priority four. This will be priority two towards the left side of the ring. And priority three then will be the bottom part of the ring. Again, our fourth highest priority is in the back. We count from one to two to three. In this case, it's a counterclockwise rotation that is an S configuration at that center. In this problem at the top right, we have our first instance where there's a double bond. Remember that when you're assigning your priorities, if there's a double bond, you put sort of these false atoms in place of where that double bond used to be. Instead of having a double bond that went to two carbons or went twice to the same carbon, you draw a pretend or a dummy atom uh, and you circle that to say, okay, that's not a real carbon coming off of there. I'm using that as part of the Conningold prelog convention. And there's also a hydrogen that's not drawn there. That's how you get set up when there are multiple bonds in a structure. Now we can proceed as we did for the other problems. Oxygen has a higher atomic number than carbon. It's the first priority. Second priority would be this carbon with another carbon coming off of it. Third priority is this carbon that has hydrogens coming off of it. And now our fourth priority is in the back. So one to two to three. Clockwise right hand turn is the R configuration. Now on the bottom left, we again have a first priority, the fourth priority hydrogen is pointing away, the second priority is the top part of the ring, the third priority is the bottom, lowest priority, fourth priority is pointing away, we just go one to two to three, that's the R isomer. 
And then over here, first priority, second priority is the part of the ring going up and to the left. Third priority is this carbon down here. And again, hydrogen is the fourth priority away from us. One to two to three, we just have to do then. That's going in a left-hand turn. That's the S configuration at that center. For this middle example on the bottom, I've drawn in the prioritization one, two, three, four. In this case, we encounter a situation where the lowest priority, the fourth priority, is neither in the front nor in the back. When this happens, you must reorient the molecule in order to place it in the front or back so that you can use the counting 1 to 2 to 3 or 3 to 1. You can't do either one of those in this situation. So we have to reorient the molecule. The easiest way, I think, for myself to do this would be to draw a simplified version of the molecule. I don't care what the specific groups are in order to be able to assign R and S configuration. I only care what's priority one, what's priority two, what's priority three, and what's priority four. Once you fill in the one, two, three, and four, you've locked in the correct configuration. Now I can manipulate the shape in my head. We're familiar with people having right hands and left hands. So if I think of this as the head of this person, and this is the feet, and this person's sort of doing push-ups here, this would be the person's right hand, and this would be the person's left hand. So if I redraw this person where their face is here, and their push-up arms are facing me, and their feet are away from me, that would be a correct way to reorient the molecule. Now the head is three, the right arm is one, the left arm is two, and the feet pointing away from me then would be four. Now that I've positioned the fourth priority thing away from me, I can count one to two to three. That is a counterclockwise progression, like a left-hand turn. That is the S configuration. Finally, we can see this chiral center here. We can label these first priority, second priority, third priority, fourth priority is away from us. Count one to two to three. That looks like a right hand turn. That's a clockwise progression. That is an R configuration. Another type of problem would be one in which we're given the name of a compound that contains the configurational isomer, R or S, and we're asked to draw this in the correct shape. And there are a couple conventions for drawing the shape. We can use our standard wedges and hash lines, as we saw in the previous problem, or we can use the Fisher projection convention. A good first approach might be to sketch, without indicating the three-dimensional shape, the core structure of 3-chloro-3-methylheptane. So we'll do that. And that's the core structure without indicating the stereochemistry yet. We should write in the priorities of these different substituents coming off of the stereogenic carbon, shown here, in order to assess which way everything should be pointing to accomplish the known S configuration. So these are the priorities, and if we were to choose to put this fourth priority substituent in the back, we would then count from one to two to three, and that would be a counterclockwise progression from one to two to three. Counterclockwise would correspond to S, so if we make that choice, that would lead to the correct isomer. Now if we wanted the R isomer, we'd have to count 3 to 2 to 1, so we'd want to put the fourth priority in the front. But in this case, we want the S configuration. Now it's even easier to draw the Fisher projection. In the Fisher projection, we know by convention that the groups at the vertical positions are away from us and the horizontal groups are towards us. So if we put our fourth priority substituent on one of the positions that is away from the viewer, we know that we want the S configuration, so we need to go in a counterclockwise progression from 1 to 2 to 3. And at this point we can just fill in our groups. 1 is chlorine, we know that because we've already drawn it one time. 2 is this chain. Second priority substituent is this chain. It's a C4 H9 chain. 
the third highest priority is this ethyl group. You can write C2H5. A lot of chemists just use ET to represent an ethyl group. And you've got to, of course, label what your fourth priority substituent is. It is a CH3. We can take a similar approach to the R33-dimethyl-2-hexanol. First, draw out the core structure without indicating the three-dimensional shape. Identify the stereogenic carbon and label it right here. And then prioritize the groups coming off of that stereogenic carbon. One, two, three, and four. Now this is an R isomer. If the H was in the back, away from the viewer, you would just count one to two to three. If we did that in this current case, that would look like a left-hand turn that's a counterclockwise progression from one to two to three. That would be the S isomer. But if we put the fourth priority in the front, then we have to count three to two to one, which is the clockwise progression. That's the correct isomer. And again, with the Fischer projection, if we put our fourth priority in the back, here that's a hydrogen, we want to go from one to two to three in a clockwise progression. Position one, substituent one, is an OH. Two is this big long chain. You can figure out the formula of that and fill that in. So C6H13. And then our third highest priority is the methyl group. So that's just a CH3 over here. And now we have the Fischer projection also showing the R isomer. These are not the only drawings that would be correct. There are a variety of ways to draw an S isomer or an R isomer for a given molecule. These give you an example of a way to draw these. Our next question starts off with a couple more definitions. We need to define the meso compound and a racemic mixture. A meso compound refers to any number of molecules that have stereogenic atoms, but which are achiral as whole molecules. A racemic mixture, on the other hand, it's a one-to-one -one mixture of two enantiomers, the dextrorotatory and levorotatory isomers, or the R isomer and the S isomer, any two compounds that are enantiomers of one another. Now, not only should we be able to define these terms, but we should be able to apply our knowledge of those definitions to actual molecules. We should label these as chiral, achiral, and or meso compounds. So let's first look for stereogenic centers. We've seen this molecule before. We have some stereogenic carbons there. We see a stereogenic carbon here. And there are no chiral atoms here on the carbon. The molecule on the right. Now if there are no chiral atoms, it can't be a meso compound, and it can't be a chiral compound. This is a chiral. In the case where I do have chiral atoms, you have to evaluate, well, is it going to be a meso compound or not? Well, this has a chiral carbon in it, the second compound, and there's no plane of symmetry, so it's a chiral molecule. The case of a meso compound comes when you do have stereogenic atoms, but there's also a plane of symmetry. So the molecule as a whole cannot be chiral. This is a meso compound. It's also achiral. You would have to label this with both terms. Every meso compound is achiral, so every meso compound would have to be labeled with both labels.